Good evening, everyone. My name is Manish Mehta from the Sunnybrook Board of Directors, and I'm pleased to offer the introductions for our discussion on OCD, what's new for 2022. Thank you for joining us online tonight. We look forward to continuing to provide great monthly lectures virtually and back in person at Sunnybrook when it is practical and comfortable for everyone to attend. I invite you to join our mailing list to receive notification about upcoming lectures. You can also find session information on the speaker series website where you have access this evening's talk. Our team from the Frederick W. Thompson Anxiety Disorder Center will be speaking to you about OCD in particular, a topic that was requested through our community email survey in the summer. Our panel of experts is here to offer some important insight, guidance, and suggestions as we recognize OCD Awareness Week. Tonight's presenters will be speaking about CBT in a post-COVID world and mindfulness for OCD. And they'll also be taking a look at new and emerging treatment options for OCD. We hope that the information presented resonates with you and helps you navigate your personal health management. To get things started, I'd like to now introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Anthony Levitt. Dr. Levitt is the chief of the Hurwitz Brain Sciences Center and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He is a medical director of the Family Navigation Project, a community-based free service helping families with youth suffering from mental illness or addiction. Dr. Levitt is also a scientist in the Evaluative Clinical Sciences with the Hurwitz Brain Sciences Research Program at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. His clinical focus is on mental health with research interests in mood disorders. We are fortunate to have Dr. Levitt guiding us through tonight's session. Thank you all for being here, and I'll now pass the microphone over to Dr. Levitt. Thank you, Manish. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening remotely for our speaker series. Uh, tonight, our lecture is, as, as Manish just said, OCD, what's new for 2022, and it's very timely, given what's gone on for the last two and a half years in our societies. And we're very lucky to have a, a great lineup uh, of Sunnybrook experts from the Frederick W. Thompson Anxiety Disorder Centers, Center that will be speaking to you tonight. Nathaniel Luckman and Dr. Rebecca Young will begin our session with a presentation entitled uh, CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy in a Post-COVID World. Then Dr. Lance Hawley will uh, share a presentation on mindfulness for OCD. And finally, Dr. Peggy Richter will present on new and emerging treatment options for OCD. After our presentations, we'll have some time to answer questions uh, you might have posed to our speakers. Uh, and many of you have already submitted uh, questions online and we invite you also to send your questions to us during the presentation using this web page. We may not be able to get to every question, but we'll try and um, get to as many as we can. And if there are two questions that are similar, we'll kind of uh, group them together so that the experts can answer your questions. So um, let me start with the first presentation and uh, uh, introductions. Uh, Nathaniel Luckman is a occupational therapist and the interim team lead at the Thompson Anxiety Disorders Centers Intensive OCD Treatment Program. It's the only uh, treatment program of its type in Canada. Uh, in addition to OCD, Nathaniel also worked with anxiety, depression, trauma, and ASD populations. Dr. Rebecca Young is a clinical psychologist at our Thompson Center and part of the intensive services team for severe OCD. In addition to her to OCD, her clinical work also focuses on anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders, and trauma. So we're glad they're here to speak to us tonight about CBT in a post-COVID world. And without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to you, uh, Dr. Young and Nathania. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay. So Nathaniel and I are gonna be talking about CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy in a post COVID world. I'll start by talking a little bit about the impact of COVID on our mental health. 
And then I'll review a little bit about what CBT is and how we apply it to OCD. And then Nathaniel will talk a bit about how CBT has evolved during the pandemic in a virtual platform. And then we'll end off with where are we now in terms of treatment? So we've been living with this pandemic for almost a few years now, and I'm sure we can all say to some extent that uh, the pandemic has negatively impacted us in some way, whether it's through isolation and loneliness when all the lockdowns happened and restrictions, lack of connections and social support, which we know are so important to us, especially during times of stress, dealing with a really uncertain future in a lot of different ways, the fear of getting sick, especially early on in the pandemic when we didn't know much about COVID and how it would impact us. The effects of actually getting sick and dealing with the symptoms, as well as some people experience job loss and also lo loss of loved ones due to COVID. So understandably with all of that extra stress, we know that rates of anxiety and depression really increased for people living in Canada. And so Mental Health Research Anxiety Canada conducted a poll in March of 2022, and that showed that Canadians definitely did experience high levels of anxiety and depression since COVID started. Specifically, we know that anxiety peaked at four times higher than pre-COVID. I think that was around um, poll number five when this was taken in February 2021. Um, now it's reduced a little bit, um, around three times higher, um, from 7% to 21%, but still quite high. And then depression doubled from 7 to 14%. So you can see in the graph below there, high anxiety is in the red line and high depression is in the orange line. And they both kind of wavered, but remained relatively high um, since the pandemic started. And so for individuals with existing mental health concerns, we know from our work with our own clients that for some people, some individuals did worsen with um, the introduction of COVID and the pandemic. For example, individuals with OCD um, who have a, a fears around uh, morality and um, inflated responsibility did have a little bit more trouble with COVID because of fears of getting COVID and then passing it on to others individuals with contamination release related OCD and fear of getting sick also experienced more challenges, whether it was related to more avoidance and isolation or also increased cleaning and washing compulsions. But we also know that others were not as impacted. And when talking to these individuals, they talked a lot about how they actually deal with stress and anxiety on a regular basis. So they were kind of used to all of this in some ways. And they also had some coping strategies um, of their own that they developed over time or also through treatment that helped buffer against some of these negative impacts of COVID. And so given the high rates of anxiety and depression that have um, increased during COVID and the pandemic, it makes sense that rates of individuals seeking mental health services also skyrocketed during this time. The Canadian Mental Health Association poll that was conducted in January 2022 also showed that more people in Ontario have been accessing mental health support compared to any other time during the pandemic. Specifically, 24% of people sought help for mental health challenges during this time compared to 17% last winter, and then also 9% only two years before. So to meet these high demand for services, many organizations began offering different types of virtual therapy, including virtual CBT. So before we go into CBT from a virtual platform, I'm going to review a little bit about what CBT is just for individuals who are not as familiar. So um, I'll use a really kind of basic example just to start off. So let's say I'm in a situation where I see a dog and I have the initial thought, what a cute dog. Well, that thought is going to lead to feelings likely of happiness or excitement and then lead me to want to approach the dog and probably pet the dog. In contrast, let's say my friend is in the same situation. She sees a dog maybe across the street, except she has an initial thought that that dog is gonna bite me. So that's a very different thought that's gonna lead to different feelings, most likely in this case, fear or anxiety. And that's gonna lead her to likely want to avoid the dog or run away. So here we have the exact same situation, but entirely different experiences of it. 
And so when we think about what's the difference here, we know it's not the situation itself that causes us to feel a certain way. It's actually our thoughts or the way that we think about that or interpret situations that makes all the difference. So in CBT, we talk a lot about the importance of our thoughts and impacting how we feel and what we do. And part of what we do in treatment is really help people manage these unhelpful thoughts that we know really drive those feelings of anxiety and depression in different ways. And so when we think about how CBT is applied to OCD, I'll give another kind of just brief example because I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in the presentations to come later. Um, but using the same example, let's say someone with OCD with contamination concerns around getting sick is also in the same situation where they see a dog, except they have this initial thought or initial intrusive thought, that dog is dirty. And so, they might then have what's called a thought about the thought or a misinterpretation that, uh oh, this dog is dirty, it's, it touches me, I'm gonna be contaminated, everything's gonna be contaminated and then I just will not be able to handle it. So you can see how that appraisal or interpretation of that initial thought is very powerful and very meaningful and would be very distressing to the person experiencing it. And that appraisal is what we really try to target a lot when we're treating individuals with OCD, because again, we know the power of our thoughts are very impactful and we wanna be able to identify those unhelpful thoughts and try to challenge them a bit um, so that we can help people better manage them. So if we have this type of appraisal or interpretation, that's definitely going to lead us to feel a lot more distress, a lot more anxiety, a lot more fear, and then also um, kind of make us engage in avoidance behavior. So we might avoid the dog entirely if possible. If not, we might go home and do a lot of cleaning or washing compulsions. So as I, sorry. As I said before, when we're treating um, OCD with CBT, we focus a lot on these appraisals. That's the thought or the cognitive part. And we might do this with different types of cognitive strategies, such as a thought record, which might sound a little bit familiar to people. And that's where we kind of put our thoughts on trial. We really challenge them, kind of the validity of them and look at the evidence for and against them. And then we also look at the behavior. So what's a little bit different in CBT for OCD compared to other types of of mental health disorders, we really want to do what's called exposure and response prevention. Um, the exposure part is where we have people face their feared outcome. So in this case, it might be um, trying to touch or approach that dog that's perceived to be dirty, and then engage in what's called response prevention or ritual prevention. And that's really the key part here for individuals with OCD. We want to help them um, refrain from engaging those compulsions when in a feared situation so that they can learn that maybe I don't actually have to do a compulsion in order to prevent the bad thing from happening. Maybe it just won't happen. Or I don't have to do the compulsion and I can actually just feel better on my own or learn to tolerate the anxiety on my own. The problem is we often don't get to actually learn that if we don't, if we don't face our fears. And so that's kind of um, CBT for OCD in a very brief nutshell. Um, and at this point, I am going to pass it back over to Nathania so that she can start talking a little bit about um, CBT in a virtual format. Thank you, Rebecca. So this is a little cartoon I found that I think we can all resonate with um, to an extent. But um, uh, as we all know, uh, CBT has had to move to the virtual platform during the pandemic, as most other services did. And oh, there's a bit of a lag here. There you go. And that was quite a bit of a change for both the providers and clients alike. Um, now, again, the virtual CBT is really quite similar to the in-person format, except that it is offered through a secure online video platform, such as Zoom Healthcare. And, you know, you all probably um, have recognized that a lot of these different um, video platforms or secure video platforms um, really boomed during the pandemic um, because it became kind of the primary mode of receiving and providing services for a lot of different sectors. 
Um, it allows us to interact and connect with each other um, in very much the same way, except everything happens through a digital screen. Um, and the strategies that we use in regards to CBT are really still the same as the ones used in person, which were the strategies that Dr. Rebecca Young just went through. Um, and we are able to actually use digital visual aids during um, some of these virtual CBT sessions to enhance the therapy process. So those of you who are familiar with Zoom, for example, they have a lot of different um, applications such as the whiteboard um, that would allow us to actually be able to draw um, on a screen, on a digital screen on Zoom, and it allows both the provider as well as the client to actually draw and interact on the whiteboard, which can be really, really helpful. Um, screen sharing, which is exactly what we're doing right now, is actually also really helpful because the client can share their homework over the screen or the provider can share a little worksheet on the screen and work on it together. So it really does open up um, a whole different world in terms of how we can use the virtual uh, model to implement CBT. Um, in terms of virtual CBT and ERP for OCD specifically, um, we did find that the virtual platform has actually been quite effective in, in being used across um, different mental health diagnoses. It did come with some limitations, but um, even with our program, again, we had to pivot completely to a virtual model for the first one and a half years of the pandemic, and we have been able to see the benefits of using this model. Um, the outpatient uh, sector of the Thompson Center has also pivoted to providing um, outpatient groups through the virtual model completely, and that's actually been uh, very effective. And we'll go through some of the pros and cons um, in a little bit more detail. Um, but of course, we, we recognize that there are some initial challenges that we need to overcome. So um, initially, when we switch to a virtual model, as maybe many of you might have experienced, um, some people were hesitant to participate in treatment over a virtual um a virtual software like Zoom because, you know, some people are concerned with security. Some people are concerned that they won't get the same type of treatment or the same quality of treatment. So those initial changes we really needed to um, warm up to and get used to. Um, but over the past one and a half years, we've really seen it really uh, being taken up by different populations. So some of the pros and cons that we found, again, with doing virtual CBT and ERP, um, specifically for OCD. So, of course, the pros is that it's it's quite convenient because most of us um, would be able to just hop on a screen and be able to, you know, meet with your therapist and start your therapy session. Um, it can be very useful for coaching exposures and it can actually improve access to services because a lot of our clients feedback, they've said that, you know, because of my anxiety, I have a hard time actually leaving my home. This allows me to just hop on my computer and receive therapy. Um, some people live very far away and they said, you know, if this wasn't offered, I wouldn't be able to actually even access the service um, or simply lack of transportation again, wherever they may live. Um, in terms of coaching, I can give you a little bit of an example in terms of how we would use um, coaching strategies over Zoom um, in the context of um, an ERP. So um, let's take a contamination example, someone who feels like um, their bathroom or their bodily fluids is contaminated would have a lot of issues usually um, with bathroom activities. And usually the home is where the OCD lives. So in using this virtual um, component of, of coaching, we can actually coach the person right in their bathroom. We can ask them to bring their phone, have us on Zoom, and then we would be able to start um, asking them to touch different things in the bathroom and really monitoring, again, their um, reaction during that exposure process and get that feedback. Whereas if this virtual model wasn't offered, we may not necessarily have the ability to go into the client's home and um, do some of these coaching uh, the same way. Um, the cons, of course, there were some cons to the virtual model. Um, we find that, you know, there is that loss of nonverbal communication, particularly from the neck down, um, especially if you're seated at a desk. Um, 
there's limitations in being to assess uh, the client's environment. So um, again, we can only see what the clients would be willing to share on screen, and that can sometimes be limiting. Um, it may be more challenging for some people. So there are people who have reported difficulty um, logging on to Zoom. Some people have difficulty um, speaking um, on camera um, due to their anxiety or other challenges. And then just simply technological challenges, um, like the most recent Rogers shutdown over I think across the country that really disrupted our ability to be able to provide services online and for people to be able to jump online. And I think that day, a lot of people missed a lot of our groups and we had to reschedule. Um, so there are obviously challenges that we needed to overcome and think about, but for the most part, we did um, find that it, it has been useful in being able to continue to provide services that are essential to this population. So where are we now? We know the pandemic is not over, but we know that things are improving. And with restrictions slowly easing, more services are now returning to in-person models or hybrid models, as have our program. Um, some have continued to maintain a virtual stream um, because of its success over the pandemic, including in the private sector. So you may see that a lot of um, private therapists are providing virtual treatment. Um, because of its convenience and, and the way it's able to provide access for people who may not live geographically in areas um, where they can access in-person services. Um, and again, there is more flexibility now in terms of how services are delivered by service providers to improve access across all sectors. And so the way we feel is that virtual service is probably going to continue to linger um, and, and continue to be provided for as long as it makes sense for um, the need of the client. Um, we know that again, indicators around anxiety and depression are improving considerably. Um, even with the uh, poll that was shared earlier, um, we know that Canada has moved into that post-recovery phase of the pandemic. Um, and we know that that high self-rated levels of anxiety have dropped. Um, same with the self-rated depression, which has also decreased by one third from the levels that was seen during COVID. Um, it is important that again, these self-reporting high anxiety and depression are still much more likely to be experiencing symptoms of a severe mental health disorder. And really this highlights the ongoing need for just timely access to mental health services in various regions in the country, which can still be a challenge. So these are some resources that we've collated. Um, there are some apps, phone apps um, that we can download, um, box breathing, relaxation audio recordings, um, as well as a relaxation and stress reduction workbook. And this is just a little cartoon again that I'd like to end off on that I think we all can resonate with. Um, Perhaps we experienced this last year when we started venturing out. Perhaps this is only starting this year. Um, but nonetheless, I think all of us can resonate at some level at some point um, during the pandemic and after. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Nathaniel. Um, take us through a, a guided tour of CBT. Um, you know, when I hear you speak about it, you make it uh, sound so simple. And I think there's something that's very straightforward, but if you don't have the wisdom and experience, sometimes uh, it's not quite as straightforward. So I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, we're now going to move on to our second presentation, and that's from uh, Dr. Lance Hawley. Dr. Hawley is the clinical lead and director of training for the Thompson Center Outpatient Service, and also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Department of Psychiatry and the University of Toronto Scarborough. Uh, over to you, Lance. Thanks very much. All right, so today I was hoping to speak with you about some of the uh, uh, current knowledge base in terms of using mindfulness-based strategies uh, to help individuals experiencing OCD. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking at a prevalence rate in the community of two to 3%. Uh, it doesn't take long when you 
run the numbers in the GTA to see that quite a few individuals experience OCD and the effects can be quite significant, uh, being the 10th leading cause of disability according to the WHO. The current best practice interventions tend to involve uh, CBT strategies, but there's an emerging literature showing support from mindfulness-based strategies to try and disrupt the OCD process. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, individuals who experience OCD often experience quite unwanted and out of character thoughts or images that are distressing. Um, as you would imagine with anyone who experiences this kind of very aversive event, um, often people are doing a lot, uh, a lot of ritualizing, a lot of other things to try to not experience that thought or image. And unfortunately, the relief that the rituals provide in the moment can often propagate the OCD cycle and lead it to continue to have an impact. So as an example of this, if someone were to feel triggered, which probably all of us have at some point over the last few years at least, uh, feeling maybe a sense that something happening like a handshake or a fist bump is filthy or unclean, there's this idea behind the scenes that that thought in and of itself means something. So in this case, meaning that, you know, if I'm a very responsible person, maybe it's my job to make sure that I am safe, that everyone else is safe. So it can be distressing to feel that burden of responsibility and often rituals have a functional connection in terms of that they serve a purpose. And in this case, not only preventing any sort of sickness perhaps, uh, but being a, a good responsible person. So the anxiety reduction that happens in the moment, unfortunately leads someone to continue with this cycle. And so often CBT models highlight this idea quite nicely. Um, and CBT remains the gold star treatment, very effective for individuals, but it does come at a cost. And sometimes people find it very difficult to tolerate some of the CBT exposure exercises. This is kind of meant to be illustrated by this picture here is that an exposure can be very effective, but for some it can also feel quite overwhelming. And you know there is the other part of this, which is that not everybody responds equally well to treatments. So there's maybe a need for us to start thinking more creatively about alternative options that are also efficacious. So that's where mindfulness can come in. Uh, so the early literature from mindfulness was showing quite a significant impact over the longer term for individuals experiencing depression. And when, once they achieved remission, we were finding effects that went past uh, acute phase depression treatment. So we started looking at this um, evidence base and thinking, you know, what are some of the options we have for working with these ideas when it comes to managing OCD? And even though there's been hundreds, if not thousands of years of wisdom around this issue, uh, from a Western perspective, often what we're discussing is the idea of trying to show up with your experience, demonstrating some amount of curiosity, using your five senses to be present, and if possible, being non-judgmental. And this can be a really hard thing for to ask for many people, because often we have this other story behind the scenes about how we see ourselves and maybe even becoming more self-critical and judgmental about the fact that we're having the experience, um, which can also lead to some additional suffering. So it kind of begs the question of, of why would someone try to show up with an experience that's so aversive? Uh, why be curious about something that you've experienced many, many times before? And how on earth do we become non-judgmental around some sort of difficult thought or image? So it takes a little bit of work, but I think that there's some idea here that's compelling where it's, it's almost like if you were mindful of a fire alarm going off, that in and of itself is not particularly enjoyable in any way, uh, but it provides important information about what's happening. And ideally, we want to take that same approach with OCD. I can be attentive to an OCD experience. It may or may not be inherently pleasant, but there's important information here that maybe can help me to decide how I choose to respond to my experience, um, which can feel different because a lot of people often feel a little bit stuck uh, being in an OCD cycle without necessarily feeling like there's a lot of options for choosing how to respond to that experience. So I thought we would maybe try this out a little bit more experientially, which is really the intention of mindfulness practice. So 
be willing to play along with me. We'll just do this briefly. Um, so you can do this in whatever position you're currently in, if you're seated or if you're on the couch or where, wherever you are. Um, I just encourage you to take a, a kind of a more upright and dignified uh, kind of position, you know, with a straight back, almost like you're being pulled up by a string. So embodying a sense of dignity and self-respect. If you're comfortable with this, you might allow your eyes to close for a few moments. We're just going to start with a chance to become aware of our breaths, not breathing any differently, just noticing and honoring each in-breath and each out-breath. Slowing things down and allowing some space for whatever's here. Perhaps even giving up the tendency we all have to try to change things or turn away from things. And just using your five senses to allow yourself to notice whatever's here in your body and mind. And each time your mind wanders to some topic, know that that's completely normal. That's what our minds do. Just allowing yourself to notice where your mind has gone and gently redirecting back to your breath and body. Returning to your breath and body as an anchor each time your mind wanders. Perhaps becoming aware of any emotion that may be present. Noticing any physical sensations present in the body with some curiosity. And as we close the exercise, slowly waking up to the room at your own pace. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. So that was a very, very brief practice, of course. And if we were talking one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we'd have an opportunity just to have a better understanding of what happened during the practice. Um, and that's really the essential piece of mindfulness is have the experience first and then use some ability to have some ability to have some discussion about what actually happened during the practice. So sometimes a practice can be really engaging and it can lead to some relief. And sometimes a practice can be boring and sometimes a practice can be something else entirely. But the idea behind any kind of practice is that we're not at least going through this autopilot mode that we sometimes fall victim to. Um, so autopilot is that sense of, I'm just kind of going through the motions. I'm really not that aware of what's happening to me. Not really curious about things that I've seen a thousand times over. And, and that can be a little bit jarring. Sometimes it's like a, an hour turns into a day, turns into a week and we blink and we really weren't showing up for our lives. So the idea is to maybe do things a little bit differently. There's this idea of walking the middle path. Sometimes, you know, doing practices can allow us to be a little bit more experientially aware of what's happening in our body and minds. Sometimes we can maybe slip out of that tendency we have to try to turn away from experiences or fix them or cling to them. And a lot of interesting learning can happen from taking this approach. One reason that we think that this approach can be effective, and this is backed up to some degree with the literature, is that sometimes by being more experientially aware it allows you to step back from your experience and recognize that even though those thoughts and images can be quite upsetting, they're not self-defining. They're, they're things that we can look at and that we can be curious about in the same way that we can with any other experience. And that can be quite powerful for someone experiencing OCD. Often there's that sense that these thoughts are self-defining. They're part of me. They represent who I am. And so the chance to step back and observe can be an interesting time to th think about, you know, like what's really going on here and what choices do I have in terms of how I want to respond to the OCD. So we'll talk about that a little bit more where if we slow things down, sometimes we can observe the thought rather than being really enmeshed with it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can notice that there's something that we feel really strongly compelled to do, like engage in a ritual. And just by slowing things down, maybe that in and of itself can represent a different choice compared to what would normally happen during an OCD cycle. And there's a really good evidence base starting to show that not only through case studies and non-controlled clinical trials, as well as clinical trials that are randomized, which is really the gold star for research, 
that people who try these ideas out can experience some really compelling uh, relief from their symptoms. Sometimes we can even see effects similar to what uh, Key et al., which are a uh, group from Hamilton that, that were able to look at the benefits of MBCT in combination with CBT. We're seeing some very significant improvements in symptoms, uh, which were somewhat similar in effect size to traditional CBT practices. And our group has also done uh, a fair amount of research in this area. We were looking at individuals who received CBT first and then received mindfulness-based CBT or the reverse, mindfulness-based CBT without CBT. And it actually looks like that there's a nice adjunctive effect, meaning that people who have benefited from CBT may experience further long-term benefits from engaging in mindfulness practices. Uh, so our protocol involves quite a few ideas. We start to talk about these kind of tendencies we have to just kind of phone it in and go into automatic pilot mode. We start talking a little bit about what is it like to constantly be trying to turn away and stomp on thoughts and suppress them and what have you. And then the opposite, of course, which is to try to fix and control and to try to make everything as predictable as it gets. And if you're like me, that that never works. So we start to try to take these ideas more specifically to discuss what is it like if we're gonna try to observe these thoughts and images differently, return to the body and breath, and maybe start to see that the thoughts are not quite so compelling. Maybe they don't have quite the same power over us that they once did. And as treatment moves on, we start to talk about how we can maybe take these ideas into other meaningful domains of our lives in order to extend the learning past the ends of the sessions. So as I mentioned, uh, we're trying to figure out not only if something is working and if it's effective, but really why is it that it's working? And there's a few possibilities here, um, which I think is really fascinating is that, you know, meditation is really just showing up in the way that we did previously. And something as simple as that can actually have significant effects on the brain, surprisingly. We start to also see for especially longer term meditators, this idea of maybe trying to use the practice in everyday life. So when you're eating, actually eat, rather than just kind of putting food in your mouth as you're multitasking and doing a hundred other things. Um, when you're walking from A to B, and maybe even I'd encourage people who are here at the meeting tonight to try this out, um, you might be surprised to find that you don't really know what's going on with your walk. You know, maybe you're not actually seeing all the people and your surroundings and the various stores and what have you on your way from, uh, you know, where you're at at home to your work. So you can start experimenting with these ideas and showing up more often can be really interesting because the idea is that if I'm going to try to take that experience and observe it, knowing that it's not part of me, know it's something that I can be curious about, you know, even in a difficult moment, I might say to myself, like, so I'm having this really difficult thought that I'm feeling really stuck. I'm not sure if I lock the door. Oh, I have such a strong urge to go over and check it. But what I'm going to try to do is bring some awareness to what's happening for me. I'm going to notice that I'm having this really compelling thought, and then I'm going to return to my breath and body, and I'm just writing it out. And sometimes that can be a nice option. There's this kind of cute idea of like, this is what dogs do. And maybe that's why they're happier is that you know if we can be the observer of our experience which is called decentering the thought can be something you're noticing the physical sensations that you're noticing don't necessarily have to be fixed uh, emotion is something that's powerful and compelling and can provide a lot of information rather than something that has to be suppressed and if you're using your five senses it can be an interesting thing to actually show up with your life more often and see what happens. With the example, I can notice myself having the thought that I really need to go and check to see if the door is closed. Um, there's a related idea that actually originally came a little bit more from the addictions uh, perspective where if there's a very, very compelling behavior, maybe it's really ingrained, maybe it provides some benefits, maybe it's been around for a long time, almost like muscle memory, sometimes we can do this thing called urge surfing, which I can start to notice that I have this really strong urge. I can tell you about the urge, I can see it increase and decrease and stay the same. 
And by playing around with rituals in this way, I can really describe to you that urge to ritualize as opposed to finding myself in a ritual cycle. Uh, a few uh, studies have come out from our group looking at possible uh, the possible effectiveness of technology-supported mindfulness, which I think uh, dovetails nicely into our discussions tonight. Um, so there is some benefits, uh, broad strokes, in terms of web-based interventions for mental health. There's uh, even some benefits from other kinds of interventions like smartphone applications. And our group started to investigate a device called the Muse, which is a headset that provides uh, almost like an opportunity to kind of gamify meditation. So it provides some basic user feedback. When your mind wanders, you start to hear the waves a little bit more strongly. And then when you refocus, the waves start to kind of fade away. Um, there's nothing uh, that we've done that is basically like a mandate to say, like, go get the Muse. It's the best. There's a lot of devices out there. We just happen to choose the Muse for a variety of reasons. And there's a few example devices here. Um, but we thought, uh, you know, maybe there's something here to the idea of being able to practice from home. Um, you don't have to really do anything other than put on a headset and practice that way rather than having to, you know, commute and all sorts of other things we do to receive treatment. So the device itself is fairly easy to put on. It connects with your cell phone. Um, while you're doing the practice, you start to see some changes in EEG that can be quite compelling. And our results indicated that we were uh, seeing some really interesting changes in our self-report measures of mindfulness and the EEG signals. So it was a nice, nice kind of example where two different ways of understanding mindfulness seem to tell the same story. So from self-report, people who felt that they were less reactive to difficult moments and were less likely to have their mind wander through their self-report we were seeing the same kind of signal with their EEG changes in terms of the Muse device, suggesting that people who are engaging in mindfulness-based training in this way, not only experience symptom improvement, but also decreased mind wandering and decreased reactivity. And reactivity, kind of think of it in the same way, like, you know, if you're feeling very triggered, you have a very visceral response to something difficult, people were having a lot less reactivity to difficult moments. We also looked at some of the underlying beliefs uh, that can go along with OCD. So for example, someone might feel that they have to do things perfectly, that they have to ritualize perfectly, that they maybe have high standards for themselves that are sometimes unachievable, to be honest. Uh, so we looked at different kinds of beliefs that may underlie improvement. And we found that there's also a signal there where the people who are able to engage in mindfulness practices also notice improvements in OCD beliefs. And it appears that that change in beliefs was the driver of symptom improvement. So thinking this through, there's maybe some interesting ideas here about trying to make an efficacious alternative treatment more readily available, more accessible. Um, maybe we could even consider expanding this further that maybe there's certain kinds of mindfulness practices that might be ideal for certain individuals. Like if you're one of those self-critical perfectionists that I mentioned, maybe engaging in a loving kindness practice would be interesting. Uh, and maybe we could be even a little bit more lighter with ourselves, give ourselves a break every once in a while and uh, maybe promote some self-compassion. So people who are far wiser than I am have been talking about this for a very long time. And I think it's just really compelling to see these ideas start to show up with uh, OCD management. Here's a variety of resources that you might consider. Um, you can also connect with me directly if you'd like at lance.holly at sunnybrook.ca if any of these ideas are compelling. And one last thought to consider as I encourage you all to maybe try these ideas ideas on and see what you what you think about anything that we've discussed tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lance. Um, you know, it just um, mindfulness makes a whole lot of sense. But every time I hear about it, 
from you it makes more sense makes more sense to me and i, it, and I it's something we can use across many fields you're talking about ocd in, in in particular but all sorts of anxiety i think uh, it's valuable so thank you our our next uh, presenter is uh, uh, a close friend and colleague dr peggy richter a psychiatrist at sunnybrook who is the head of the frederick w thompson anxiety disorder center and director of the clinic uh, Dr. Richter is a professor at the University of Toronto's Department of Psychiatry and an associate scientist at the Research Institute at Sunnybrook. And she's conducting a neuroscience research into OCD and related disorders. Dr. Richter and I uh, both had the same mentor. And I think uh, it's safe to say that both of us are sitting here today uh, because of that uh, remarkable mentor that we met around about the same time many years ago, Dr. Dr. Russell Joffe. Um, and uh, by the way, I just want to remind you just before uh, I hand the microphone over to Dr. Richter that if you have questions, uh, we're going to go through all the, the talks first. And there'll be questions at the end, so please record your questions as uh, uh, you may have heard from, they may have had from other speakers um, as you listen to Dr. Richter as well. Uh, you can go on to the, the website to record your uh, questions. So Dr. Richter, your microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Anthony. Yeah, it's been a lot of years for the two of us. Um, and then wonderful years and getting to know all the other people in this in this room today. Uh, so I feel very fortunate in the people I've worked with for many years now. All right, I'm hoping everybody can see my slides. Everything good? Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take us through um, a talk that's uh, a bit more of a hodgepodge of, of things. I'm trying to cover uh, a lot of ground in terms of highlighting for people on this, on this Zoom event, some of the treatments that are beginning to get more mainstream attention or maybe even are mainstream, but are still fairly new in terms of being recognized as such. There we go. So I'm gonna take us through some uh, briefly introducing re some recent developments or refinements. We could use a variety of words to describe this in how we do CBT for OCD. Uh, I'll highlight some promising new medications and the psychedelics in particular. And if some of you are wondering what I mean by that, I do indeed mean the psychedelics and we, we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm also going to touch a bit on pharmacogenetics, which is the genetics of drug response, which may be used as a tool to help us make smarter medication choices. And last, I'm going to touch on some new or emerging biological therapies. So that's kind of a rough outline. So as, as you've heard today, we've talked a lot about CBT. We've also talked about mindfulness, the psychological treatments. And in particular, CBT, which is the most evidence-based supported treatment at this point for OCD, and medications are both collectively seen as what we call our first-line treatments, meaning these are the treatments that have this best balance between evidence for their effic efficacy or effectiveness and being safe and well-tolerated, having limited side effects or any negative unwanted effects. So a lot of the other treatments out there that are not first line may be very effective, but may just have less strong evidence at this point bolstering their use, or maybe somewhat less effective or have other compromises in terms of more side effects or other issues. And when I say that, even though both are considered first line, most of us who work with clients with OCD and who've gone through training would say CBT is overall though, the most highly effective treatment of, of the two of these. There are a lot of guidelines out there and those guidelines will all stress the role of each, but in terms of long-term outcomes, CBT typically comes out on top. And I thought I'd just show people a little bit about the comparative evidence for their effectiveness. So this was a, a huge, huge meta-analysis where they looked at congregate results from 86 different studies 
of commonly used medications in OCD or behavior therapy or cognitive therapy, which is what the BT and CT on the screen there stand for. And this is the degree of people who experienced response to these interventions. So I think what is pretty easy to appreciate is that our medications typically help around 50 to 60% of people, at least with any one medication. If people go on to try several, that response rate may go up to about 70% or slightly better with multiple trials. Um, by contrast, I think it's pretty obvious that behavior therapy and cognitive therapy or the combined CBT that we've talked about already a little bit before now by uh, our previous speakers helps about 90% of people. So again, that's part of the reason for why we typically would talk about CBT as the most ideal first line treatment. Having said that though, CBT depends on certain basic principles when it's done in the traditional fashion. Uh, as I mentioned, the focus, and as you heard before from Dr. Young and, and Nathaniel Luckman, the traditional way of doing CBT would focus on the behavior therapy part or what we call exposure and response prevention or the ERP model. And this model, really focuses on this idea of habituation, the idea that your anxiety will diminish as you practice staying in a situation that is triggering of anxiety. And as you practice over that single session, so looking at this blue line as an example of a first exposure, somebody who has, for example, checking rituals and likes well, I shouldn't say likes, it feels the need to check the front door over and over again or check their car door to make sure it's locked. So somebody with those kinds of OCD symptoms, if challenging themselves to limit their checking of the front door to simply closing it and maybe, you know, pulling on it once or twice, would feel typically a real surge of anxiety initially, which would last for quite a while in what we might call a plateau phase and then eventually come down because the body only sustains that kind of physiological response to the anxiety trigger for a limited amount of time, typically an hour or less. So that's habituation in the session. The anxiety goes up and eventually they habituate to that trigger and they come down. And our traditional model then was based on the principle that habituation happens not only within a single session, but between sessions. So that with repeated practice of the same trigger, they get easier and easier. And here, for example, we see somebody practicing that same challenge on the seventh day and saying, well, my anxiety still goes up, but it's not nearly as horrible as before. It's still pretty unpleasant. And by the time they get to their 20th practice or so, they might say, well, this is really manageable. It really doesn't bother me nearly as much as before. And traditionally we would do this, oopsie, according to a, a hierarchy classically or a ladder of distressing situations, typically beginning with easy ones. And this is a really simplified version. There's usually a lot more than three runs to the fear ladder, but you know, perhaps starting with doorknobs for somebody with contamination issues that look clean, progressing eventually to really immaculate public washrooms, which would probably be very high up on most people's hierarchies. And eventually even going for something like this. And some people may say, well, why would anyone want to do that? Why would anyone use a bathroom like that? And part of what we often talk about in OCD treatment is that we, we go somewhat for an overcorrection because we want people to have the flexibility to deal with whatever life throws at them. And while a lot of people may get to this point and say, well, that's enough for me, thank you very much. What happens when you're out one day and the only washroom nearby when you need to go looks like this one? So we want people to have that flexibility and that option. So that would be the classic exposure and response prevention model that we would rely on. The problem with this is that it's really hard to do for a lot of people. Doing something that feels terrifying is not a pleasant experience for any of us. And for those of you who don't have OCD in the audience, who are just kind of 
wondering about this a little. If we think of another example that maybe is a little closer to home, for example, um, I was on a Zoom call with my boss and then I thought I muted myself and I said to one of my colleagues on the call, oh, he makes me crazy. I wish he'd just shut up sometimes. And then you get off and think, did he get off the call before I did that? <laughs> what if he heard me, right? Let's just imagine a, a virtual example here. I think most of us would feel a very strong surge of anxiety. If we were to ask you to do something like that deliberately, just make a negative comment about your boss the moment he stepped off a call, many of us might have some hesitation. We might say, how about I just make sure he's really off the call before I risk something like that and upsetting him and causing difficulties for myself. Um, for people with OCD, it's much, much worse. And they experience that with so many triggers. So it, it requires a great deal of willingness and motivation to put yourself in the way of these challenging situations. And that's led to people thinking about are there other ways we can do CBT that might make it a little easier or more effective, more palatable one way or another. And the other thing is that not everybody would experience that classic habituation, um, which was another problem we used to see quite, quite frequently. It wasn't the usual problem, but for, for most people, but it certainly happened for a sizable minority of people. And so one thing that's come along is basing our treatment on the principles of what we call inhibitory learning or the recognition that we don't actually get rid of fear memories. We simply develop new safety-based associations that over time will inhibit those fearful memories. So to go back to that dog example that you heard earlier this evening, um, somebody with fears of dogs, for example, might be encouraged to go to dog parks and gradually get closer and closer to dogs, maybe initially behind the fence, then in the park, maybe with somebody near them and eventually, you know, allowing themselves to pat the dogs. And over time, they're going to build up a lot of hopefully pleasant memories of those dogs. And that old fear of being bitten by a dog begins to seem less and less reasonable and isn't brought up in the moment nearly as much when they now see dogs that are kind of playing and clearly friendly. So part of this is recognizing that anxiety doesn't need to decline. It's lovely if it does, but not essential. Um, we also work to actually challenge their expectancies. So in that example, they might think, well, if I walk up to a dog and, you know, touch it quickly, maybe the dog's more likely to bite me. So we would get them to do that thing and see, well, over time, nothing bad really happened. Or in the case of OCD, you know, thinking the bad thought about something you fear terribly, which for some people with OCD would be a terrifying thing, a thought that their parents might get COVID and become very ill. So allowing themselves to think the thought and say, nothing really happened. Um, and I love this cartoon on this slide, which is Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes in the dark. So putting together a number of fear triggers into one big exposure, although I promise we would never dangle anyone off a building in our program. That, that's a step too far for us, um, but that would be the idea. And then the other kind of approach would be mindfulness and its close cousin ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy. So we've already heard a whole lot about mindfulness-based CBT, which as Dr. Holly has shared with you really has quite a bit of evidence now for OCD and is very much an emerging treatment. But I thought I'd also mention this other new wave treatment acceptance and commitment therapy, which incorporates mindfulness and as well really focuses on what we would call committed, committed actions, moving in directions that are consistent with your values and taking those actions to live your best life and to do what is important to yourself. And so combining this principle with CBT can also be another helpful way to go, although this one certainly has at this point very limited evidence around its effectiveness, but a lot of belief and a lot of agreement among experts that it is really valuable as a way of further in making our CBT more likely to be successful in practice. There's also development of computerized CBT or internet 
assisted or internet supported CBT and apps. There's also technology-based techniques. So we already heard from Dr. Holly again about certain devices, for example, which are looking increasingly beneficial to a lot of individuals with mood or anxiety issues. Um, and in fact, for many of us out there as, a, as another way to kind of uh, learn mindfulness using a different technique. These kinds of things are typically focused more on what we would think of as traditional CBT, but delivered either entirely uh, in a computer program or with a therapist done online or with some combination of the two. And these are just a number of examples of some that are around. So these upper three all involve uh, live therapists. Um, Ontario Structured Psychotherapy is actually pretty traditional. I, I think it's a bit of a mistake that I've listed it there. Um, I think this was from a list of accessible treatments for people and I let that creep in by mistake, but it's certainly a nice way to access um, some CBT in some parts of the province. These are both um, programs that provide this computerized access to CBT. Uh, nonetheless, working to some extent with a therapist. And then there are all kinds of apps that can be used. And I wanted to highlight um, NoCD or NOCD, which is an OCD specific app. It is not free, unfortunately, but it does give you both an app so you can work on it independently, as well as connecting you with a therapist in a more cost effective way. Um, and there are a bunch of others that are really wonderful, some more focused on uh, anxiety more generally and classic CBT and mindfulness techniques. I also wanted to highlight that more intensive CBT is also something that I think is increasingly recognized as a really good option to consider when regular CBT doesn't work for someone. So we get lots of people coming through our program who will try some CBT and either it gets them a little further ahead, but not enough. Or for some people, particularly with more severe illness, they are just not really able to progress with sessions once a week as we typically deliver it in outpatient work. And so intensive CBT is an an alternative for people like this that actually has shown very good effectiveness, uh, benefiting somewhere between 50 and 75% of people with severe OCD, even after failing conventional outpatient treatment. Um, but that's with a considerable investment of time and effort. Often it's done in what we would call a residential treatment setting where people would stay on site kind of in a dorm-like environment and our facility, which is actually housed at a neighboring site called Bellwood Health Services, um, is very much like that. It's a dorm-like environment, it's comfortable and people are there live or they can also attend as day patients coming in and out, commuting each day to be with us or even virtually. So we also will have people joining by Zoom depending on what we feel is likely to be most beneficial for them and which option they prefer. So this is something that people should also give a lot of consideration to. And then we get, I think, to a, an interesting part of the talk, which is that psychedelic drugs, what a lot of us would have thought of as drugs of abuse for many years, and for anybody who's uh, approaching an age, myself and Dr. Levitt, definitely older than the others on the call today. You know, we may remember the 70s and the 60s and how people felt about these drugs then, and they became at one point fairly frightening. But what has happened is that like a lot of things that the tide has turned. And in the last 10 years, there's been <clears throat> a huge upsurge of interest in a number of these medications. And I just included just a random smattering of articles, I thought, just in, in covers, just to highlight how broad this coverage is. I really don't think there's any major periodical or journal or magazine out there that hasn't done an article, pardon me, on the use of psychedelics in psychiatry in the last five years. So what are we talking about? Well, there are a lot of these different substances. Um, I would say in some ways, um, one of the first actually to be identified was psilocybin back in 
the even the 30s. And we know that some of these substances like psilocybin and ayahuasca were used uh, traditionally by indigenous people for religious ceremonies uh, to develop greater enlightenment and openness and have spiritual reconnecting experiences for centuries. But in terms of Western medicine, we're talking about the 30s, 40s, and really research beginning to ramp up into the 50s and 60s until essentially there began to be fears about how these were being abused now by the general public, leading to a lot of legislation to restrict their use and really a complete halt to psychiatric research in these into these substances since the 70s until approximately 10 years ago. At this point, we're seeing lots of exploration of them, however, and they've become huge topics of interest for depression, for suicidal ideation, for substance use disorders, for OCD, and as well, I should mention for end of life anxiety and depression, which has had a lot of research done on it and how these, these different options may ease some of that distress, but that's, I think, something I, I felt was kind of beyond the scope of today's talk, so I won't talk about those uses. So in terms of the substances that we're talking about, we're talking primarily about things like um, LSD, psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms or shrooms, ayahuasca, which is known by the chemical name DMT, um, the street drug ecstasy, also known as MDMA, and ketamine. And ketamine is slightly different in the sense that ketamine was not initially thought of as a psychedelic drug. It's a dissociative anesthetic agent that's been used for medical anesthesia for many years and gives a very light dissociative state, but it turns out actually shares a lot of properties in common with these others. So what do we know about these so far? The, the truth is a limited amount, but enough to say that there's already really very strong evidence for MDMA or ecstasy assisted psychotherapy and people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, where it seems that using guidance with a therapist in tandem with a low dose of this uh, psychedelic or hallucinogenic medication actually induces an openness to new experience and ability to go back and experience that pain, that painful experience, and now experience more positive emotions and be able to process it differently. Uh, psilocybin or mushrooms, uh, again, done with assisted psychotherapy or supported by psychotherapy, has also shown quite a bit of evidence in depression. And some of these are just summarized in this one graph that I found online that's quite recent showing the outcomes. And what you can see here is decline in depression score with some of these different agents. Another one that has really been recognized as a breakthrough drug along with uh, psilocybin at this point is ketamine. And ketamine has shown immense breakthrough promise for both very severe or treatment resistant depression, as well as chronic suicidal ideation, which typically we see in the context of depression, but is an indication for ketamine use in its own right now. And this is something that again is actually beginning to be used fairly widely, can be found privately and in some limited public, publicly funded ways now. As far as some of the other substances, at this point, the data is promising, but really that's all we can say about it. Very limited research. Now, what about OCD specifically? You'll notice I don't have anything listed there with OCD, and that's because at this point, we don't have a lot of data. There are a couple of small studies of ketamine with OCD, but they are very, very short in scale, lasting over a duration of a matter of weeks. So at this point, we know nothing about the the um, any lasting benefits of the ketamine dosing. And in fact, there's been some question about, uh, about that and some concerns about whether it would be long lasting enough to really be therapeutically useful. Psilocybin was looked at in one early, what we would call a case series or an open study where there's no controls or placebo or randomization. And so we know that this kind of trial is likely to um, overstate 
or find exaggerated positive outcomes compared to a study that is blinded or double blind or randomized. And so while psilocybin is thought to be very, very promising in OCD, and there actually are some large trials just getting underway now, at this point, we just don't have that level of evidence, but that's probably the most promising looking of these substances right now for OCD. Sorry, I forgot that I had a whole slide on ketamine um, in my desire to tell you all about it. So this is just uh, a bit more detail, but I think this is kind of interesting because this is just showing the number of publications that have been coming out year by year to the year 2020 on ketamine, just kind of showing that real explosion in the last 10 years. And this would be mirrored in terms of the other psychedelics, although with more of a three to five year time frame, because it's really very recent that people have been able to actually put forward any studies of these substances with reasonable uh, likelihood of being, uh, being permitted to go forward. Now, what about new medications? Are there any? And the answer is kind of yes. Um, people often ask me, are there any new breakthrough drugs? Is there anything that's a lot better than the stuff I've tried before? Um, and the answer is <clears throat> not, not, not currently, I would say. There really isn't anything that looks like a clear breakthrough based on evidence as yet for OCD. But as I said, um, a lot of interest in psilocybin. So this is um, one study looking at a synthetic psilocybin or it's metabolite psilocin um, in a trial for OCD that's been cleared in the US. Um, I know that we also uh, in partnership with uh, CAMH are going to be starting a pilot study of psilocybin for OCD very shortly. Um, and the hope is to expand that into a larger scale study. I think another substance that's looking very interesting is one that's also right now undergoing drug trials at about uh, 120 sites across the US, Canada, and Europe, including Sunnybrook. And that is a drug called Troriliazole, which is related to something that is on the market now called Riliazole, which has actually shown pretty good evidence in OCD, but Riliazole was a very tough drug to take. Besides being exceedingly costly, it's associated with a lot of difficult side effects, a not insignificant risk of liver problems, and is hard to absorb when it's taken by mouth. And so Troiliazole is now being looked at in a careful double-blind trial to see whether it would give people the benefits of Riliazole without those problems. And so far looking good, but it's still in early days. I do have other things on this table, but even less, I would say, is, is known about them and there is less excitement for them generally. So I'm not really going to speak to them. All right, so what else can we say about what might be new and different? Pharmacogenetics, I think, is the other potential paradigm shift, at least for some people. Why some people? Well, let's talk about what we mean here. When we're talking about pharmacogenetics, what we're talking about is using an individual's own genetic makeup to somehow be able to know in advance what is the right treatment for that person based on their genetic makeup. So another term that's often used for this is personalized medicine. And the idea there is that we can identify exactly for you what is the right medication at the right dose. So what does that look like? This is a cute, I think, little schematic that illustrates it. So we can imagine a group of people with OCD or with depression, all of whom look outwardly the same. But as I mentioned, we know right now statistically that no more than 60% or so will respond to any one medication they try. But we don't know how to identify in advance who those 30% are or 40% are who won't. So with pharmacogenetics, by genotyping across the human genome, fairly broadly, typically, we may be able to identify the genetic differences that differ between those people who respond at the usual dose and tolerate the drugs well to those who either don't respond or get really toxic on the usual doses of the medication. Now, wouldn't that be ideal? It doesn't allow foolproof prediction, you know, Unlike what this gentleman wants, it certainly is not a guarantee that we would give somebody the medication that will definitely make them better. 
but it does certainly raise the odds, particularly if you're someone who has some mutations in a number of the genes that we look at. And the reason for that is that it turns out that there are a lot of these mutations around. I, I like to tell my patients that most of us are mutants, meaning we carry at least a few mutations in our liver genes that are important for the metabolism or breakdown of most of the commonly used drugs. And it turns out that because of these mutations, some of us will not produce much of certain enzymes and would become quite toxic on the usual dose. Others of us may produce too little enzyme, not break down the medication at all, um, or sorry, produce too much enzyme, have extra copies, and as a result, break down the drug so rapidly that we in fact would need double or even triple the dose of somebody who's a poor metabolizer to get the same response. And so the idea is to be able to, to use this knowledge in advance. Now, this is just a sample of some of the articles that have come out in OCD, mostly by our team. And as you can see, this is not a large field. So when it comes to OCD, relatively little is known. So again, I'm going to step back and talk about depression for a moment where a little bit more is done. And this is just a review that came out quite recently from Ontario Health that looked at how advantageous using pharmacogenetic testing was with a number of different pharmacogenetic tests that are marketed. And anything to the right of this line um, would be advantageous over not using genetic testing. Now this effect may look pretty tiny. Um, in fact, it is meaningful. It's not a huge effect, generally speaking. And you know, some of them seem to really hug the line, but overall, the overall effect is positive. And it becomes even more positive if we limit testing to people who've already tried one or more drugs with either toxicity or no benefit, because at that point, the likelihood that they may carry some of these problematic mutations becomes a lot higher. And so we're more likely to find useful information. This is a list of some of the tests that are available in Canada currently. Um, and uh, this is not because I have any financial relationship or other vested interest, but these are three of the tests that are available generally that have actually published really, well, reasonably good evidence from larger scale studies um, to show that they worked and improved the likelihood of responding to the medication prescribed in depression at least. So early days, but looking good. Now, what do we do when nothing works? So I'm just gonna end today by talking a little bit about other biological therapies that are increasingly getting a lot of attention as well. So these include things like repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS, deep brain stimulation, and psychosurgery. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about these very briefly. So transcranial magnetic stimulation is uh, one of these neuromodulation treatments or neuromodulatory treatments. All of these are seen to work by changing the activity in the brain in such a way that it seems to reduce symptoms of illness. Um, and RTMS at this point is very well accepted and really has very good evidence to show its benefits in both depression and OCD. There's also been development of a newer version of this called deep TMS or DTMS, which may be arguably even slightly better than regular RTMS for OCD. And this is showing, for example, the likelihood of response in people with OCD um, in active treatment compared to sham treatment where neither they nor the investigators knew which they were actually getting. Were they actually getting active treatment through the helmet or was it all basically a mock-up to simulate it? And we see a very strong and powerful advantage with a lot more improvement or a lot more response in people who got the active treatment. One of the biggest problems at this point, however, is that although DTMS is approved in Canada, it's generally not covered anywhere in the country. And privately, it is quite costly. But hopefully this is a situation that will change in coming years. It is somewhat more available for depression. And so we would hope OCD would follow suit. 
Now, what about these other interventions? I'm just gonna mention them extremely briefly because here we get into things that actually involve surgery um, where we are actually going into the brain to some extent. Uh, and both actually are being looked at specifically here at Sunnybrook through our Hark Whale Center uh, in, in tandem with, with our Thompson Center for OCD. So deep brain stimulation involves implantation of electrodes deep into the brain, into the brain circuit that we feel relates to OCD um, and has shown a great deal of promise. And then the other option, as I mentioned, has been psychosurgery, where we would traditionally, using what we would call stereotactic approaches, um, have a neurosurgeon actually make uh, two little holes in the skull, insert electrodes into the brain and heat them up to cauterize the brain tissue, create deliberately some very small lesions, which are permanent, interrupting the activity in that OCD brain circuit and showing clear benefit in OCD also used as with DBS in really severe or resistant depression. We've been fortunate enough at Sunnybrook, however, to be in the vanguard of using newer technologies that are less invasive, specifically being able to use MRI guided focused ultrasound, which actually uses a thousand beams of ultrasound all triangulated on the same place in the brain under live MRI guidance. So there's no invasiveness in the sense of no scalpel, but at the same time, we're still creating those lesions in the brain in this type of surgery. And this is looking tremendously promising at this point in time in the smallest numbers of people around the world who have experienced this treatment for OCD and depression and without any seemingly um, significant long-term negative consequences. Neither of these are cures by any means. What we typically saw with our, our focused ultrasound study in OCD, and this is just a, a pictorial diagram showing improvement on a severity measure of OCD, was that people who started out as exceedingly severe in their OCD, completely disabled generally, would end up having what we would call mild to moderate OCD. They still had the illness, they were still impacted in their daily life, but they certainly showed a very significant decrease in the severity and were much more likely at that point to be able to function more in their lives again. So let me sum up. Although CBT and medications help most people, there's going to be a significant proportion of people who they don't benefit. We've talked about a variety of ways of modifying CBT, either to make it more manageable for some people and or more successful and other ways of delivering it, for example, by computer apps and virtually. We've talked about intensive CBT as another way of ramping up the dose and getting more success. I've talked briefly about some new therapeutic agents in development of which some of these psychedelic drugs appear the most promising. We've mentioned the role of pharmacogenetic testing and lastly, neuromodulation mainly for those, however, with very severe and intractable illness. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. Um, thank you for taking us on that tour of what's new, interesting, and I think hopeful for the treatment of OCD. Now we've come to the point of time we have questions and uh, please feel free to post your questions uh, as we go along, but we have several questions. Um, I'd like to what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose the question generally, and maybe you are, I'll pose it to one of you, but if others want to contribute, please do. But we've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, six to 10 questions. If I constellate or condense what people have asked, so just uh, govern yourselves accordingly. Okay. So the question, first question is an interesting question. Uh, how closely related are the symptoms of OCD to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? So how, how related are OCD and PTSD symptoms? Uh, Lance, do you wanna have a go at that? Uh, I think I'm gonna defer to Peggy on this one. Oh, okay. okay, all right, go ahead, Peggy. Uh, it's a good question. Um, traditionally, we would have seen them as very separate conditions. So PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder typically is seen as arising from a life-threatening 
dangerous situation in which individuals feel powerless to prevent something terrible from happening to themselves or witness something like this happening to others and develop this long-term pattern subsequently of, um, of a constellation of symptoms, including a lot of anxiety, arousal, and reliving of the experience in nightmares or through flashbacks, for example. So in that sense, it's very different from OCD, which is characterized by obsessions and compulsions. But what I would say is that increasingly, I think as a society, we're recognizing that trauma isn't always this capital T obvious big trauma, like being in a, in a war-torn zone, um, being in a terrible accident or witnessing a terrible accident and the like. And that small T, lowercase t trauma, um, related to really adverse early life experiences, for example, can nonetheless set us up with similar difficulties for life. And there has been some speculation that in fact, for that reason, a trauma-based approach can be maybe useful in OCD. That's not exactly saying that trauma and OCD necessarily share a whole lot in common, but there may be more overlap there than we used to think. I don't know, Nathania or Rebecca, if either of you want to add. Yeah, I'll just add to, um, in terms of the treatment, there, there is some overlap. I think um, individual PTSD and OCD both tend to have intrusive thoughts or images um, related to, in PTSD, the traumatic event um, that they try to avoid, and in OCD, related to um, their triggers or kind of their, their core fear. So in that sense, um, oh, and there is also a lot of avoidance around both as well. So um, in terms of the treatment, we do um, exposure actually in both, depending on the type of trauma that the person experienced. So it is also similar in terms of doing exposure to the trigger or the fear, and then probably also trying not to engage in um, rituals for OCD and safety behaviors for um, PTSD. Not that's helpful at all. Okay, thank you, very good. Okay, so maybe Lance, I can ask you this one. There's a question that says, I have a friend with OCD and I do everything she asks because I don't want her to get anxious. Am I doing the best thing to help her? Uh, yeah, this is a hard position people often find themselves in is that they're trying to find a way to support an individual with OCD and uh, the type of support really matters. So I think that probably this friend is well-intentioned with their approach, but ultimately the, the right move is to try to help support someone as they engage in, you know, some of the strategies that we've talked about tonight in order to manage their symptoms more effectively. Um, so there's this idea called accommodation, which can often be uh, quite important in treatment is that you want to support someone autonomously as they kind of push back as opposed to supporting the OCD, which might mean uh, having a discussion, you know, like when when you're asking me to, in a way, help you avoid the experience or help you engage in rituals or maybe even reassure you, um, often that might feel good in the moment, but is actually not helpful over the longer term. So, you know, maybe you and I can try to figure out a way together um, so that we can kind of more effectively uh, discuss what's the best option in that moment. Uh, and we've had a lot of success with people trying to figure that out, you know, whether it's a family member or a friend or a loved one who's supporting, you know, like maybe there's some key idea that we can discuss, maybe there's a key intervention strategy that we could even practice together when, when that moment happens. Um, or maybe it's even just an opportunity to kind of self-reflect on what's going on and notice like this is the voice of the OCD more so than uh, anything else. And, you know, like the, the benefits of trying to find a, another way to respond rather than accommodate, like that that can be pretty meaningful. So, uh, but it, it's a hard discussion, I think, for most people to have. It's like, I, I want to support you, but not the OCD. So what are our options here? I wonder if I can ask a follow-up question and any of you can answer that. And that is, uh, is OCD a, a family condition? Okay, it's not caused by the family, but is the family a great, uh, or, or caregivers or loved ones, are they a, a, a potentially great ally or asset to people in the management of this condition? So, uh, Nathania uh, or uh, Rebecca? Sure, I, I can jump in for sure. And I mean, this is something that we talk about a lot in the intensive program, um, particularly with the population that we see in the intensive program. 
Um, we find family is very much a big part of the OCD because they're usually um, the first ones to kind of face the OCD um, in their loved ones. And kind of like what Dr. Holly was saying earlier, they respond in the best way they can and the best way they know how. Um, and for the most part, they don't want to increase the suffering of their loved ones. Um, and that's usually the hardest part or that the, the, the newest, I guess, concept that we would have to teach family members when they first enter the intensive program is this idea that you can support your loved ones without supporting their OCD, um, which is why we do family education uh, sessions. We do um, one-on-one -on -one family therapy sessions with their loved ones just to be able to actually create a plan in terms of how would you um, be able to support your loved one with OCD without actually supporting their OCD um, by essentially doing everything that their OCD wants you to do. So, okay, thank you. I think it's very helpful. Um, anyone else want to make a comment? Okay. Uh, okay. So this is a question saying lots of uh, when it comes to OCD, there's lots of uh, letters: OCD, CBT, ERP. What about EFT? Emotion focused therapy is that of any value in the treatment of OCD? It's kind of the new kid on the block, EFT. Um, Rebecca, do you want to start sure. or? Sure, I'll try. And then maybe Lance can back me up. Um, yeah, so I would say definitely like as an adjunct um, to CBT ERP. Um, we do definitely help people kind of not only get in touch with their emotions, but become more aware of them and help them manage them. Because um, oftentimes with um, OCD, the emotions are so intense in terms of level of distress when they are exposed to a triggering situation that they just feel like they cannot handle it. Um, so there's a lot of avoidance of emotion. Sometimes there's numbing of, of emotions. Um, and so after doing that for so long, it can be really hard to really get in touch with them again and feel um, comfortable or kind of allow them to be there. So I think doing some emotion focused type of strategies um, to help people focus on their emotions in a different way than they're used to can definitely be helpful. I don't know about specific EFT strategies. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, so is a question about uh, um, what would the best treatment be for an older person with uh, OCD. And so this was a question about an 85 year old, but I'm going to expand that to say, uh, can treatment, can OCD be seen in the elderly, uh, but can also be seen in the young person? And is the treatment in the elderly the same as an adult as it may be the same for an adolescent or child? Dr. Richter, do you want to have a go at that one? Sure, I'll start maybe. So, what I would say, first of all, is that OCD is much more likely to start young. I think uh, that's important to know at the outset. So most people develop OCD sometime, sometime either in childhood, their teens or their 20s, into the mid 30s. Developing OCD brand new without having had any experience of it earlier in life in the 50s and beyond is really quite quite rare. And so one of the questions that's always raised when somebody talks about treating an older person, first of all, is to make sure that there is no other kind of brain disease going on that may have brought on the OCD. So if they've had the OCD for 40 years, this is probably regular old OCD that's just persistent. But if somebody started developing OCD in their 60s and is now in their 70s or 80s, we would be really concerned about making sure they didn't have, for example, a stroke or some other kind of lesion develop in their brain or some other kind of brain disease, which may be relatively treatable and hopefully benign um, and where we would wanna target that underlying disease process first. Assuming it's regular old OCD, then the answer is that our treatment looks very much the same, except that we want to keep in mind that medications can become more challenging to use as we get older. Our body metabolizes them more slowly. Certain side effects can become more problematic, and there are more opportunities for interaction with other medications, which realistically, if you're in your 70s and 80s, you're more likely to be taking in conjunction with our medication. And so I would say CBT 
in a healthy uh, 70, 80 year old would still be the way we want to go. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that one. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question. Uh, and I think, uh, I think this question is worth asking just so that you can provide some clarity. This question I'll maybe I'll ask uh, Lance here. Uh, is CBT and ERP synonymous? In other words, which is the gold standard for OCD? Is it ERS for... Uh, Um, if we have frozen, um, so I, th I think what I was hearing was the, um, with the response prevention ERP, or is it CBT or both? Yeah, um, so good question. Uh, acronyms are very rarely clarifying, at least if you're me. Um, so CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy really refers to the umbrella term of how a set of principles can be applied, whether it's for depression or with or whether it's for social anxiety or OCD. So the cognitive behavioral approach usually involves an integration of trying to do some form of self-monitoring, um, psychoeducation about the issue, and a set of strategies that are helpful in terms of managing that particular anxiety or mood uh, issue, for example. ERP is integrated within CBT approaches for OCD. So CBT is sort of the umbrella term and ERP being one of the most effective strategies within CBT in order to, to promote symptom improvement. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. I've turned off my video because clearly I was having some connectivity issues. I'm sorry. Um, okay, next question. Um, can, uh, can CBT be used for religious scrupulosity? That's cool call it religious uh, preoccupation, uh, maybe a, um, obsessionality or um, let's call it, let's call it uh, preoccupation. Uh, and, and can you use, and the second part of that is if you use things like exposure and response prevention, can you use it for, for, for those kinds of thoughts as opposed to actions? And is exposure with response prevention a lasting intervention? So three questions. Can you use it for religious preoccupation, scrupulosity? Can you use it for something that's a thought-based issue? And does it, does it last? In other words, can you do it short-term and it lasts for you know, a month or two or does it last longer? So let's try and pick that apart. I, I'll leave it to, open to any of you. Um, so uh, uh, Nathaniel. Or... Do you want to go first, Lance? Oh, you can, you can go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, short answer is yes to the first part, which was, um, can it be used for religious scrupulosity OCD? For sure. Um, forgot the second part. And can it be used for treatments that for things that are largely thought, thought and not based. action? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, we certainly see that a lot. And I think, again, the initial conception is that it, it would be hard to do exposures around these thought-based um, types of obsessions, but we, we can certainly do exposures um, around the thoughts themselves. And this usually involves things like writing down the thoughts, um, saying the thoughts out loud, um, writing imaginary scripts uh, around the thoughts that um, are, are presenting as obsessions. Um, and in terms of the uh, solution being, I guess, short-lived, I think it's like any other type of OCD obsessions where um, continuous work is always recommended. So even for people who come through our program, um, we would never recommend that they don't seek further treatment after. Um, even if they have you know, remarkable success, we would say, you still need a therapist for maintenance um, purposes because we know OCD is one of those conditions um, that tend to be chronic. And again, it's something that may come, you know, in ebbs and flows, especially if there are stressors in their lives or certain things happen that's not expected. Um, so like any other obsessions, I would say that these strategies, these same strategies can be used. Um, and we would always recommend some sort of follow-up maintenance therapy to maintain the gains. I don't know if anybody else want to add to that. 
That's a very helpful answer, actually. Thank you. I want to just add one thing, which is that over the years, um, and these are mostly older studies now, but there were a whole host of studies that looked at how well people with more typical uh, OCD, not the, not the severe forms of OCD that we typically get in our program, but people who would normally see an outpatient therapy or come into our outpatient program in our groups, how they did over time post-CBT. And actually a whole host of these showed that about 80% remained well one year after treatment ended, 80% remained well five years after treatment ended, and about 80% remained well even 10 years later. So although, especially as the illness becomes clearly more severe, we do worry about that need for maintenance. And for even for these people, that didn't mean they didn't have episodes of coaching, as Nathaniel is referring to. Nonetheless, it's kind of amazing the staying power that good CBT will have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so here's a question, and I think it goes to you, Dr. Richter. Are we any closer to understanding exactly what's going on in the brain with OCD in terms of being able to cure it? Oh, let's ask the easy questions. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, the answer there is kind of yes and no. We are closer. Um, we certainly know a whole lot more about what goes on in the brain than we did 10 or 20 years ago. But does that mean we actually have a really fulsome understanding of the way, for example, we understand the mechanism of diabetes or hypertension or even arthritis for that matter, or heart disease? The answer is no, it's not yet that clear. But we do know, for example, that there are a host of genetic factors involved. Genetics play a very important role in it. And we are getting close to hitting enough participants worldwide in our international genetic consortiums that we should be in the next five years really beginning to hone in more on a lot of these genes. We know that these genes control mechanisms and so we see abnormalities in the neurotransmitters that some of these genes code for. And, and we're beginning to understand that the chemicals in the brain that are involved in OCD are not as simple as we used to think and involve a host of different neurotransmitters that have a complex interplay. And we know that there is an underlying brain circuit like a lot of illnesses, OCD is a brain circuit disorder, which is not to say that older thoughts about the base of OCD, which was that it was learned or related to the way we think about things, uh, cognitive models and learning theory about OCD don't still play a role, they do. But I think the biology is, is getting a little better elucidated. Cure was the other word I heard in that question though. And I would say, um, the, the tough answer first is there is no cure. This is a chronic illness for most people. There are some lucky people who have more episodic illness or may just have a, an episode or two. But like a lot of chronic illnesses, and I often talk about asthma and diabetes because those are two that I happen to be gifted with, um, you can nonetheless live and learn to live a very rich and full life with OCD with appropriate treatment. Thank you. And thank you for that hopeful message too. Okay, so this question, I guess, is for Lance and Rebecca, although any of you can jump in. So obsessions and compulsions to do with bodily fluids has it affected my relationships. How can I recover? What can I do to overcome this? Uh, Rebecca, you want to take that one? Or? Sure, if I'm, I can start if you want to... Um add. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's hard. And I think um, it's really common with that type of OCD um, to have difficulties in um, relationships and with intimacy. So that's really common and normal in, in that case. In terms of how we treat that or how we work on it, definitely ERP or exposure and response prevention, like we keep talking about, would be the first and probably most effective strategy as hard as it is. And it wouldn't be something like starting with your most anxiety provoking fear around bodily fluids, whether that is being intimate or not, we would create a hierarchy with um, your different triggers based on different levels of anxiety and start with some on the lower level, um, whether it's like using 
a washroom or touching surfaces or floors or anywhere that maybe seems a little bit less distressing and then obviously building up to allow you to um, have the type of relationship that you want with your partner and be intimate or whatever it is that the OCD is preventing you from doing. So definitely ERP in a gradual way um, is very effective for this type of OCD and the concerns that you're sharing. I'm not sure if Lance wants to add. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that that's the right approach. Um, often there's also a, a sense kind of cognitively about why those specific um, issues would be threatening for a person. And um, assuming that there's there's not, you know, medical issues or what have you, um, often bodily fluids are actually like surprisingly like neutral and, and not causing any sort of, uh, you know, massive problems altogether. Like they, they originate from our healthy bodies and Sometimes, you know, like the perception is, is really important to discuss with these treatments. Um, in some cases, too, if, if this is something that the person's partner was willing to be involved with, like doing uh, exposures uh, with the support of the partner, I think would be really important, uh, especially in this context. So, yeah, that's just a few thoughts. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have time for two more questions. So the next one is to Nathania, and I realize this might be specific, but I'm still going to ask you. And, um, so the question was, is there any connection or overlap between OCD and ASD, that is uh, autism spectrum disorder? Yeah, um, I mean, that's actually one that's been coming up a lot lately, um, at least in my radar. But we've certainly seen a lot of overlap in terms of the um, behaviors between OCD and ASD. Um, and I would say one of the biggest differences that we recognize between the behaviors, which can both be rigid and repetitive, um, is that the behaviors, the rigidities and repetitive behaviors related to ASD tend to be ego egocentonic, sorry, um, as in that it doesn't cause the person performing the behaviors anxiety, but is actually done as a way of self-soothing. Um, whereas in OCD, a lot of the obsessive compulsive behaviors are repetitive and rigid in nature, but is usually distressing and it's usually ego dystonic or against the person's values or what they actually want to do. So um, this is one of the most important distinction, I guess, that we would want to make if someone comes in um, to treatment with both ASD or um, OCD diagnoses, um, or if someone comes into treatment with only one or the other diagnosis, but you are noticing, I guess, some of the differences in terms of the motivation underlying the repetitive behaviors. Um, and so, yes, we definitely see it a lot. And I think um, in the literature, we are starting to see, again, a growth in terms of specific um, evidence-based treatment for people with both diagnoses of OCD and ASD, because there are additional challenges with um, doing CBT with the population with ASD. Um, one of the more, um, I guess, one of the adaptations that we have done that we found to be um, effective with the ASD population is adding more visuals, um, providing more concrete examples, using more concrete statements and explaining the CBT concepts, um, doing ERPs that are again, rewarding and very concretely rewarding for the person can also uh, be more effective in that way. I don't know if anybody else here wanna jump in and add to that. Yeah, I think it's a, a good and comprehensive answer. I, I just learned something, that's great, thank you. Um, so the last question I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Dr. Richter, it's, uh, if, and I know it's a, it's, <laughs> It's a question for which there's a simple answer, but I think you'll understand where it's coming from. If somebody with OCD wants to conceive, are there any ways to identify and even edit the gene so as not to pass it on? Oh, what an, what an interesting question. So mm. I would say that at this point in time, absolutely there is no possibility because we don't fully understand. And in fact, it, what is very clear is that OCD is not a simple genetic condition. It's not a matter of a defect or a variation in one gene that's causing the illness. It's variations 
that inherited collectively in a number of genes lead to a number of processes probably going awry and creating the illness. And that would make it very complicated. And at this point in time, we haven't identified those genetic factors well enough, uh, let alone have the ability to edit them. So first of all, we don't know those genetic causes. And then the second part was if we did, could we edit? And we are not yet at that point in time for most human illnesses, certainly not at conception. I mean, what is done for some illnesses like um, uh, well, Huntington's disease would be an example of one, although usually by the time people know it, they're past that age, but um, there are a few others uh, like this where we know it's a simple, cystic fibrosis is a great example. We know it's a simple single gene mutation that causes the illness. And so if somebody is aware of carrying it, what can be done is, is selective implantation. So they would go through uh, conception, uh, in a test tube basically, and um, they can then, the, the ensuing embryos can be tested for the gene so that only the ones that are not carrying the disease gene are implanted. But that's very different from editing and we're not yet really at editing yet. I just had another question come in, so I'm gonna slip it in just before the end. Uh, what can I take to enhance or raise serotonin levels? to help with OCD. And I think it's really natural. Nat oh, what can I take? That's a natural source, that's the question. So I think I'll go first. And if I leave any big ones out, let me know, guys. So probably uh, one of the best known ones is St. John's wort. Uh, St. John's wort is a natural occurring substance found in plants. Um, and it turns out that St. John's wort is a natural SSRI. So I think this is where there's often this confusion and people often equate natural with somehow better tolerated, safer, um, somehow more kind to the body. And the reality is St. John's wort, if taken at a high enough dose, does the same thing in the body as any other SSRI medication, which are our first line drugs typically for OCD. Um, and so it will have side effects if taken in a high enough dose, but it does work. There are a number of other substances that have been tried over the years that may push up levels of serotonin, but either have shown really, really weak evidence or, or negative evidence, meaning they didn't work. So things like taking tryptophan, 5-hydroxy tryptophan, um, tyrosine, there's a number of compounds out there that uh, theoretically would impact on serotonin levels because they in, impact on the serotonin synthesis or breakdown processes. But in fact, in actual use in the human body, they don't seem to really change levels much in the brain. Yes, I think the, the point that Dr. Richter has been making during this whole presentation and other presenters is that OCD is multifactorial. It has components which may be genetic, which may have to do with circuitry, which may have to do with chemicals, which may have to do with the receptors, etc. And simply trying to increase serotonin may be a small drop in the bucket and may not even be helpful at all. And I think that uh, part of what we... Uh, part of the most important things are some of these natural things like mindfulness and uh, and exposure response prevention. These could also be called natural. So, okay, so that brings us to the end and the conclusion of our question and answers. I, I want to thank you all for your participation. Before I wrap up the evening, I just have a, a few more points to share with you. Please be sure to fill to take a moment to fill out your electronic evaluation form. It's it's very helpful for us to plan uh, talks in other areas, but also when we talk about OCD in the future. If you, you, know, you can also add your name to our mailing list for future sessions uh, if you haven't already done so. But once again, I'd like to thank our speakers for a incredibly informative, um, down to earth uh, and, and helpful evening. So Rebecca Young, Nathaniel Luckman, Lance Hawley and Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you also to Manish Mehta from the Sunnybrook Board of Directors who did tonight's uh, welcome. And a big thank you to all our audience for joining us.